Hello, and thank you for tuning into the Portland State University Studio MFA Remote Artist Talk Series. The series is sponsored by generous contributions from the Wingate Foundation and the Deep Priest Professorship Fund by the Harold and Erlene Schnitzer Care Foundation. We would like to start this event by acknowledging that Portland State University rests on the traditional village sites of the Motnoma, Kaflame, Clackmas, Bends of the Chinook, Tualatin Kalapuya, Molala, and many other tribes who made their homes along the Columbia River. Motnoma is a band of Chinooks that lived in this area. We thank the descendants of these tribes for being the original stewards and protectors of these lands since time immemorial. This series brings together artists, curators, and critics from a variety of disciplines to explore the subjects of their work before a live audience. All of our lectures for the spring term are being held remotely and live streamed through our PSU YouTube channel. Please follow our Instagram account at PSU Studio MFA to learn more about artist talks in the future. At the end of this morning's presentation, we'll be having a Q&A with Sergio Delgado Moya and the MFA cohort and we'll also be fielding questions through the live stream chat. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing Sergio Delgado Moya. Delgado Moya is a scholar of Latin America studies and a queer first generation college graduate. He was born in Tijuana, Mexico, and raised between Baja California and California. His research is grounded in the Latin American region and all of Delgado Moya's major research projects are transnational in scope and then emphasize the social and political dynamics of art beyond the sphere of aesthetic. Delgado Moy is an associate professor of Spanish and Portuguese at Emory University and the author of Delirious Consumption, Aesthetics and Consumer Capitalism in Mexico and Brazil. Thank you so much for speaking with us today, Sergio. Hello. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good, good evening. Uh, I hope you're well. Wherever you are, I hope you're well. Um, it's a pleasure to be here to speak to all of you today. I'm really, really looking forward to, to our conversation. And I want to thank you for making possible, for, for taking the time and for, for making space to, to have the conversation that we're, we're going to, to have today. Um, I'm especially um, looking forward to the, the question and answer period where um, I hope we'll have plenty of time to, to talk a little bit more about um, interests that we all share um, and to, to have a little time too to, to learn about the kind of projects um, you're doing and the kind of interests that um, you're exploring as part of um, your MFA program. Um, I um, prepared a, a presentation today uh, around my second book project. Um, this is a book uh, entitled A Nervous Archive, uh, Sensationalism and the Potency of Horror. Um, it's a book length project uh, that I've been working on for, for a little bit of time now. And I thought that uh, in order to sort of structure the conversation that we're going to have today, um, what I'll do is to, to share some slides with you um, to show you some of the, the artworks that I'm working with uh, as part of this project and to summarize the, the, the ideas and the, the arguments and the key terms that I'm exploring um, as part of, um, as part of this, this project. Um, I, um, before starting, um, I'd like to thank uh, Ralph Puget uh, for helping organize today's um, event. Um, and I'd like to thank the, uh, the staff at the MFA program at Portland State University uh, for making possible um, today's talk. So um, I'm going to move on now to a screen share. And um, there it is. But would you all uh, mind confirming that you can see the screen? Um, maybe just send a quick chat. Check yes, we can see it. Okay, great. So I'll go ahead and start. Um, so again, the title of this project is um, A Nervous Archive, Sensationalism and the Potency of Horror. I'm going to spend some time talking about what I understand with this term, a nervous archive. Um, and if you'd like, I'm happy to talk about the, the idea, the notion of, of the potency of, of horror um, during the question and answer uh, period. 
I'm also going to be talking a little bit about what sensationalism is and, and how I understand it. So let's get started. Um, first, by asking, well, what is sensationalism and what are crime tabloids? In this project, um, even though I started um, this project as a, a, a general history of sensationalism, as the project developed, um, I focused on a smaller subset of publications known as crime tabloids. And I'm gonna spend a few minutes um, sort of defining those two terms. So sensationalism, first and foremost, um, the word itself is, is, is old, it's a few centuries old, but it's in the 19th century when the word sensationalism starts circulating with the meaning uh, we generally ascribe to it today. In the 19th century, as newspapers um, started to become um, institutionalized and more popular as forms of mass communication, sensationalism became a term that defined a certain kind of journalism, a journalism that relied on emotional impact in a certain, and also in a certain uh, sort of melodramatic uh, construction of narrative um, in order to attract readers and to sustain the reader's attention. This is also a form of journalism and by extension, a form of narrative and in a form of visual storytelling that is well known for explicitly presenting images um, that come across as shocking, especially um, images that have to do with crime and images that have to do with sex and images that have to do with subject matter that is generally regarded as scandalous for one reason or another. Now, I wanna point out the following um, sensationalism in the English speaking world emerged as a form of journalism and as a form of storytelling in the 19th century right around the time as literacy rates were going up in the English speaking world in places like the United States and the United Kingdom. So um, the two sort of phenomena, they're correlated and they're parallel as literacy rates go up among an industrial working class and a recently urbanized um, poor class. Uh, sensationalism gets established as a very popular, a wildly popular form of journalism. And I wanna point that out and highlight it, this association between a sort of growing literacy rate, a growing popularity of um, the print, uh, the print press and the emergence of sensationalism as an important fact. Um, here you have an example of the kind of um, newspaper, the kind of uh, sensationalist journalism that emerged in uh, 19th century, uh, uh, United States, and this is the, the New York world. This is the issue from Friday, April 20th, 1900. And you see from the front page, you get a sense of the kind of editorial line, the kind of subject matter that these publications were covering. Um, suicide and suicide attempts, um, psychiatric wards, um, sex crimes, violence against women, um, crime in general are the kind of subject matter that you frequently see covered by these kinds of publications. Um, what you have on screen now are um, two examples, two more examples of sensationalist newspapers or sensationalist journalism. The one on the left side of the screen um, is from Mexico from a publication um, titled Alarma. Uh, and the one on the right is from a publication titled The Daily News, which is was published in New York. Now, one important difference between um, the English speaking world and the context in which I am working with for this project, which is the context of Latin America and Latin America, Latin American sensationalist journalism in particular, is that whereas in the United States, sensationalism has a, a sort of first explosive moment of growth in the 19th century, in Latin America, uh, sensationalist publications and crime focused publications in particular, they start exploding not in the 19th century, but in the 20th century. And that uh, partially or largely has to do with a difference in the rates of increasing literacy in the two regions. Whereas in the United States, literacy rates grew dramatically in the 19th century. In most of Latin America, that growth in literacy rates uh, only came in the 20th century. So in the 20th century, um, around the 1920s and the 1930s, in places like Mexico, um, as the literacy rates start going up, um, as the number of people who are able to read starts increasing, 
publications like Alarma uh, start multiplying and they start um, sort of banking on tremendous commercial success. The example of Alarma is particularly compelling. Alarma was published between the 1960s and the 2010s, so a span of about five decades. And in the second half of the 20th century, Alarma was uh, the most popular uh, news publications, print news publication in Mexico. Um, uh, at the time that it began to be published, it quickly reached a circulation of 100,000 issues per week. Um, and at its peak, it was publishing somewhere in the region of 2.3 million issues per week, um, which is a huge circulation, much bigger than um, any other newspaper or any newspaper of record in Mexico. So sort of to summarize um, some, of, um, some of this information, um, I want us all to keep in mind the fact that these sensationalist publications, newspapers or tabloids that were focusing on sensationalist subject matter and on crime in particular were hugely popular. They were um, among the most, if not the most widely read popular print matter in the places where they were published. Here's two more examples of crime tabloids from different national contexts. On the left side, you have um, the, a crime tabloid published in Colombia uh, called El Vespertino. Uh, and then on the right side, you have um, a crime a tabloid, a sensationalist newspaper published in, in Chile, in Santiago de Chile. Uh, the title of that or the name of that publication is La Tercera or La Tercera de la Hora. All right. Now, um, so, so much for what sensationalism is and what crime tabloids are. Um, now, I want to spend a few minutes talking to you about, talking to you about this idea of a, a nervous archive. What is, what is a nervous archive? What is it that makes um, an archive a nervous archive? So I wanna start with the word nervous. Um, it's a word that um, the more this word, the more this term started working as a sort of agglutinating um, image for this project, um, the more I became interested in the, the history of the word and it turned out to be um, very uh, generative for the kind of thinking I'm trying to do with this project. So nervous has a, a long history. It dates back to, to classical Latin. And even though in, in recent times, its meaning has been reduced, um, it's, it's sort of longer meaning is, is, is quite interesting. And I think first and foremost, it's good to keep in mind that early uses of the term and uses of the term in other languages, in languages like Spanish and Portuguese, um, refer to not so much a mental state or a psychological state, but a physical or corporeal state. To be nervous, um, uh, first and foremost, in early uses of the term, meant to be rich in fibers and sinews and, and tendons. Something nervous was something that was rich in those kinds of connective tissues, the tissues that connect flesh to the bone. Um, nervous thus had a connotation of something that was tough, something that was strong, something that had that texture of toughness and strength. And those were the kind of qualities that came to mind in early uses in the English language of the term um, nervous. Now in the past, like nowadays, the word nervous also had a connotation of energy, of some kind of energetic state. Um, to be nervous in the sense that writing can be nervous, for instance, meant in the past, as it means today, something like being filled with energy, maybe even being overburdened by energy. To be nervous in the sense is to sort of carry the kind of energy that tendons themselves carry. Tendons as a kind of bodily tissue, as a corporeal tissue, it's those, um, those pieces of, um, of body, of corporeal matter that transfer energy, so to speak, um, between the bone and the, and the flesh, between the bone and the muscle. And I thought that connotation of the word was fascinating and, and intriguing for reasons that we can talk about during the, the question and answer session. Now, with time, this term nervous began referencing a very particular kind of sensitivity, one often tinged with negative connotations, with connotations of something that is out of order or something that is not functional, 
due to uh, an excess of energy. To be nervous does seem to mean something or someone that was too excitable, too agitated, or too upset. To be nervous came to stand for something or someone that was restless in a negative kind of way. Anxious, afraid, worried, apprehensive. These are the words that nowadays often function as synonyms for nervous. Now, with all this information in mind, what could a nervous archive be? Or what's the advantage of describing an archive as a nervous archive, um, as opposed to just a, an archive, generally speaking? The, the kind of the, the idea I want to present to you all today, the, the kind of argument I'm trying to explore in this project, is that as a depository of images, as a sort of source of stories, of subjects, of subject matters, and of images, Sensationalism, largely speaking, and crime tabloids in particular, they constitute an archive. You can go and search for them and find out uh, snapshots and stories, pictures of a whole history of a city, of a nation, of a people. But it's not any kind of archive. I think it's more accurately, accurately described as a, a nervous archive in the senses that we just explore. In more figurative senses, this nervous archive, it kind of, it, it works as a depository of images um, that connects um, what Francis Bacon, the English painter, referred to as the figurative on the one side, what we understand through narratives and through stories, and the figure with capital F on the other side, which is not quite reduced to narratives, not quite reduced to stories, something that's much more forceful, uh, much, um, much more hard to contain um, than the figurative level of an image or of a story. Um, this kind of nervous archive, the way that I understand it and the way that I'm trying to present it in this project is also the kind of depository that can serve as a living link of what someone like Sueli Rolnik and Felix Guattari before her um, call um, the dimension of forms on the other hand, on the one hand and the dimension of forces on the other hand. And I'm happy to, to, to discuss um, these two terms and how a nervous archive serves as a bridge between these two dimensions, if you're interested in, in talking a little bit more about that. Now, before moving uh, forward, I wanna discuss one last implication of this idea of working with a, a nervous archive. So if we, um, uh, sort of entertain the possibility, or if we take seriously the possibility that crime tabloids constitute an archive, and furthermore, if we take seriously the possibility that crime tabloids constitute a nervous kind of archive, then a series of implications open up for us to consider. A series of questions sort of emerge um, from that proposition. One of them is the following. If crime tabloids are indeed an archive, and if crime tabloids are indeed a nervous kind of archive, then we can ask ourselves, what kind of knowledge is being stored? What kind of knowledge um, can be produced on the basis of this archive? What kind of knowledge can be sustained on the basis of a nervous kind of archive? And in order to answer that question, I think the term nervous also can do a lot of good work for us. Um, now, I'm going to ask you to sort of um, engage in a little bit of a, um, a thought um, exercise with me. And first of all, I'd like us to imagine what uh, sort of run of the mill, a regular institutionalized and franchise archive looks like. Now, imagine the kind of knowledge that's produced in conventional and franchise institutional archives. Imagine, uh, to put it in other words, the kind of knowledge that is produced in a, in a library, a university library, a city library, a public library. Now, imagine the kind of perspectives vis-a-vis -vis life that these archives are meant to shape and are meant to mold. This kind of knowledge, the knowledge that is stored in a place like a university library, the kind of knowledge that is produced on the basis of working in a university library is meant to form and inform. It's meant to form us as students and as citizens, and it's meant to inform us 
as students and as citizens, as scholars and as citizens. And this kind of knowledge, it, it's certainly helpful. It's even necessary as we set out to understand how a society works, how our society works, and how we can fit within that society, how we can engage within that society as it is currently constituted. So these archives are important. Now, as a, a side note or a parenthetical note, I'd like to point out that um, archives such as the ones constituted by university libraries often, uh, mo more often than not, do not store the kind of publications I'm working with in this project. So if you go and try to search for something like crime tabloids in Latin America, you will not find any or will find very few in your university library, um, whereas you'll find plenty of newspapers of records from the same places where these crime tabloids were published. Now, imagine the kind of knowledge produced by this other kind of archive, by a nervous archive. Imagine the kind of knowledge that's produced by depositories of images, by depositories of stories of the kind brought together in crime tabloids and in sensationalist publications. This knowledge is disturbing. Why is it disturbing? It's disturbing on account of the subject matter that these crimes, uh, that these crime tabloids cover, subject matter such as crime, um, sex, and the lives of subjects often deemed to be uh, marginalized or somehow scandalous, queer subjects, um, sex workers, so on and so forth. Um, and this knowledge um, doesn't really communicate so much as it moves. This is the kind of knowledge that doesn't really work by providing you information. It works by moving you in a visceral way, often in a visceral way. This kind of knowledge and the force that this knowledge constitutes can and is often reactively reduced. It is often reactively co-opted as nothing more than shock, nothing more than entertainment, nothing more than titillation, nothing more than just a numbing force. Um, and in fact, most crime tabloids, and I wanna be very um, clear about this, even though I'm making the case from, for crime tabloids as an interesting, as a rich source of information, as a rich um, archive, um, I want to point out the fact that most of these crime tabloids um, exploit the subject matter that they present for commercial purposes and often reduce this information, these life stories, this subject matter to nothing more than entertainment, nothing more than shock. However, that same force that those crime tabloids contain, the force of horror, the force of shock, can also, and under certain circumstances, be actively re reappropriated as something other than shock, as something other than entertainment. The disturbing force, the disturbing impact, the disturbing effect that these crime tabloids can have can also be adapted, it can be changed in the face of forces that were always there, but that were not seen, that were not acknowledged. Um, that we're not unconscious. And here, in order to sort of provide some kind of clarity, some kind of concrete example of what, what I mean here, um, I have an image in mind, and it's um, the image of what a photograph of a dead body can do, uh, the photograph of a dead corpse can do. Crime tabloids, um, especially in the places that I'm, I'm researching for this project, in places like Mexico, Colombia, and in Chile, crime tabloids often feature photographs of, uh, of dead bodies, photographs of corpses on their front pages. Now, those corpses as featured in the tabloid, um, they're being used, so to speak. Those photographs are being deployed for commercial purposes, for reactive purposes. They're being deployed as photographs that help the tabloid sell newspapers. It helps the tabloid uh, sort of thrive commercially. Now, those same photographs, even though more often than not, even though those photographs are being used exploitatively, those same photographs can also be reappropriated and have been reappropriated for the purpose of some kind of active intervention in the world, the kind of intervention that addresses um, systemic structures of abuse, systemic structures of exploitation. Um, and a kind of active use that wants to undo those structures. And an example of that, a powerful example of that, is 
the uses of uh, a dead corpse, the uses of a, a dead body that were made um, by the mother of Emmett Till, um, a young black man um, who was murdered at around the time of the, the, the outset of the civil rights movement in the United States. Um, a photograph of Emmett Till um, circulated widely um, as the civil rights movement um, was emerging in the United States. That's a photograph that was um, produced um, in accordance with the wishes of Emmett Till's own mother, who insisted that the photograph of her child be shown to audiences in the United States and throughout the world, so that those audiences could feel the horror that she had felt as a mother um, of that young black child when she saw the terrible things that had been done uh, to her child. So I think this kind of use, this kind of appropriation of a photograph of um, horrific horror is the kind of example I try to keep close when I think about um, possible active um, uses and appropriations of these kinds of images. Now, um, crime tabloids, I think in this sense, they constitute a kind of social unconscious. And this is an idea uh, that was first um, suggested by an artist in Chile that who, who who I include in this project, whose name is Eugenio Deadborn. Now, when we read uh, crime tabloids as a kind of social unconscious, um, as a source of documents, historical and otherwise, um, these crime tabloids demand that we tune our attention to a, a kind of social unconscious, a dimension of experience that's pulsing at the heart of state-driven institutional frameworks, um, but that is usually kept out of sight or that is usually dismissed or ignored for being too intimate, too obscene, too trivial, too tawdry, or too banal. The idea here is that crime tabloids in particular, and this nervous archives more generally, it sort of demands that we look at things that are deemed to be too banal or too tawdry, too scandalous, to be seriously regarded. Notice here that crime tabloids they usually deal with the most intimate and the grimmest aspects of lives lived under the burden of poverty and racial and sexual difference. By this, I mean the following. If you look at a newspaper like the New York Times in the 1950s, the kind of people that were featured in the New York Times, the photographs that were published in the New York Times and the stories that were told in the New York Times, they're stories that more often than not corresponded to a privileged and wealthy segment of the population. Part of this project involves doing a comparison, uh, a numerical comparison, uh, sort of a, a quantitative comparison of the coverage that newspapers of record give um, to a certain kind of subject, um, a racialized or poor subject as opposed to crime tabloids. And the, the one sort of big difference that emerges when you compare these two kinds of newspapers is that newspapers of record, newspapers like the New York Times, especially in decades like the 1950s and 1960s and 1970s, the kind of stories that they were covering left a very small percentage, a very small margin to give visibility to those poor subjects, those racialized subjects, the most marginalized subjects um, in society. Crying tabloids, on the other hand, the majority of their photographs or majority of their stories, the majority of um, the editorial interest of those crime tabloids falls on marginalized um, members of society. Now, these tabloids, of course, they frame the lives of marginalized members of society abusively. They go about covering the lives of marginalized members of society, of society exploitatively. Um, and because they do so, anyone that's interested in the kind of micro-political underpinnings of power, anyone that's interested in racism, sexism, classism, homo and transphobias, the kind of forces that breed, uh, that breed, um, that breed force into power structure um, have worked in frequently through the images and stories anthologized in crime tabloids. So to say this more simply, um, crime tabloids, they're deemed too exploitative, they're deemed to be too abusive to be of any kind of interest to those of us that are not just interested in racism, sexism, classism, and so forth, but that are interested in understanding 
um, those structures of power in order to undo them. What I want to suggest here is that even though there's good reasons to ignore crime tabloids or to sort of dismiss them as being too exploitative, I think that when we dismiss this huge archive of images and of stories for being too exploitative, we're also unwittingly participating in the kind of dynamics that makes crime tabloids complicit with power. I think one of the arguments that I'm trying to explore as part of this project is that crime tabloids work perversely and they do so by doing the following. Not only do crime tabloids focus on the lives of the most marginalized members of society, crime tabloids expose those lives in such an explicit and in such a frontal way that those same lives become too obscene, they become too shocking in order to be registered as important. When we follow the dynamics of the obscene and the shocking, as we try to understand these lives through the tabloids, by dismissing the tabloids, I think we perhaps unwittingly participate in that perverse function of power that crime tabloids have. We ignore those lives for being too exploitative or too abusive, or we ignore the coverage of those lives. All right, so that's the point. Well, that's the point that I just made. Now, um, I want to use the rest of the time allotted today to me to go over a few examples. So um, before looking at um, artist work, um, sourcing materials from these kinds of crime tabloids, I just want to show you um, an example of, of, of uh, the kind of subject and the kind of subject matter that's covered by these crime tabloids. What you have in front of you is the, the front page of the crime, crime tabloid uh, titled Alarma, which was published in Mexico. Now, Alarma, like many of the crime tabloids um, that were published in the Americas towards the middle of the 20th century, they had what you could call like a stable repertoire of figures or characters that appeared um, time and again in the front pages um, and in the, the, uh, the rest of the crime tabloid. These are subjects that you could um, sort of uh, abstractly describe as gendered subjects. Um, often the people uh, featured in these publications are women or effeminate or feminine subjects. Um, and these are subjects who are also often racialized. And these are often subjects that are marked by some kind of sexual difference, either through sex work or in the case of the, the women featured in this, in this front cover, uh, subjects that are sort of marked um, by the, the sexual difference um, that transsexuality constitutes. Um, here's a quote by a colleague, and I'm gonna skip that in the interest of time. Now, um, how do artists tap into this nervous archive? How do artists sort of work with this this vast depository of images and stories that I'm calling a nervous archive. So an example of an artist um, that did a lot of work with these kinds of materials um, that actively sort of sourced out images and stories um, from places like crime tablets in order to, to go about producing art is Andy Warhol. So Andy Warhol, as, as many of you know, um, some of his earliest work um, in what uh, eventually came to be theorized as, as pop art. Um, some of that earliest work uh, revolved around issues or, or, or subject matter um, related to death and disaster. Um, and a series of um, some of these works um, eventually sort of grouped together as a death and disaster series. They're a good example of the kind of work that artists are doing when they go to this nervous archive in order to, to produce artwork. Um, in works like Ambulance Disaster from 1963 and 1964, what you have is um, uh, an art production, a visual art production by someone like Andy Warhol that was produced by either um, sourcing images that were directly lifted from sensationalist news uh, publications or using images that were made by the photographers, the photojournalists working for these publications, but that were not even published in the, um, in the newspaper because they were deemed to be too, too vivid or too explicit or too scandalous to be published by, by the newspaper. Um, 
another um, example of the kind of um, the kind of uh, work that Andy Warhol was producing uh, by either directly sourcing materials from sensationalist news publications or by being in dialogue with these publications are his portraits of um, of Jackie Kennedy and other famous uh, women of the time, uh, women like um, Liz Taylor, for instance, or Marilyn Monroe. And here, um, I just like to uh, point out a, a fact that has been studied by other colleagues, uh, other um, colleagues working in art history, and it's the fact that even though we often think of Andy Warhol as a, an artist who was interested in um, celebrity women, it's good to point out that his interest was a little bit more specific. It wasn't just celebrity women that interest him, interested him. It was uh, women who were famous um, and who were going or undergoing some kind of public um, distress or public tragedy. In the case of Jackie Kennedy, um, Andy Warhol becomes interested in her after the assassination of her dead husband, uh, John F. Kennedy. In the case of Liz Taylor, Andy Warhol's interest dates to a period in Liz Taylor's life, life when she was hospitalized uh, in a movie set, I believe. And um, in the case of Marilyn Monroe, uh, Andy Warhol's interest dates to uh, uh, Marilyn Monroe's um, suicide. The kind of, exactly the same kind of stories that you would see covered in a crime tabloid, uh, murder, um, illness, and uh, suicide. And lastly, uh, Warhol also produced um, images uh, that related to racial strife in the United States in the 1960s. And I think it's, it's interesting to try to think about the relationship between these images and the kind of work, uh, the kind of coverage that crime tabloids were making of these, of these events at the time. Um, in the Latin American context, one artist in particular who's well known for working with these, these kinds of materials is Beatriz Gonzalez. Beatriz Gonzalez is a, a Colombian um, artist. Uh, she's known mostly as a, as a painter. Um, she's been active since um, the 1950s, the 1960s is the period when she becomes um, very well known, especially for a series of paintings that I'll, uh, I'll focus on today, titled The Suicides of Sisga. And uh, she, um, she's still active, she's still alive, and she's also a, a well-known educator. Um, that uh, who's been teaching in, in Colombian institutions for a while now. Now, um, Beatriz Gonzalez, uh, one of the, the sort of, she, she's got a number of, um, of uh, characteristics to her work that are, are interesting and relevant to this project for a number of reasons. So um, as I said, uh, her, her sort of breakthrough in the, the world of art was through a series of paintings. And this is one example of the, the, the paintings that uh, first gave her prominence in the art world in Colombia and in, in Latin America, widely speaking. These are um, paintings that she produced um, by using a photograph that was published in a crime tabloid. And we'll look at the reproduction of that crime tabloid in a second. Subsequently after that, um, what Beatriz Gonzalez did was to, to, to sort of to mesh that interest with other interventions that eventually became sort of characteristic interventions of, of Beatriz Gonzalez. For instance, um, uh, using furniture as the, the kind of platform, the kind of medium for her paintings. You see an example of that um, right here towards the middle in that sort of commode, that piece of furniture that has a, a reproduction of the Mona Lisa. Um, and um, I'm happy to talk about um, those works too. The ones that interest me are works such as this one, The Suicides of Sisga or Los Suicidas del Sisga. These are uh, a series of three paintings that um, Beatriz Gonzalez produced in the 1960s. And the image that she used was a photograph that was published in June 28, 1965 um, by a newspaper titled El Vespertino. This is a photograph of a, a couple who was reported to have committed suicide together. Uh, in fact, further investigation, as I sort of found out by looking at um, some of the other newspapers that were covering this event, it wasn't so much a double suicide as it was a murder suicide. Um, it was a case of a, a man who had murdered his uh, romantic partner and then um, eventually committing suicide. They took this photograph um, a few days prior to the, to the, the, the tragic death of, of this woman and the suicide of this man. And the photograph was published um, 
in the the newspaper that um, that covered their 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 tragic death. Um, now, interestingly enough, um, Beatriz Gonzalez she decided to reproduce this photograph in her paintings in 1960s uh, without actually reading the story. All she did was uh, she came across this image and she was so taken by what she called the flatness of the image and the impact that that flatness had that she went ahead and um, used that image as the basis of a series of paintings without actually realizing the story that was behind this this image. And it was only decades later in dialogue with friends and, and colleagues that she came to realize uh, the sort of the, the depth of the story that that she was um, reproducing in her in her artworks. Um, eventually, um, especially towards the 1970s and the 1980s, um, Beatriz Gonzalez made um, crime tabloids in particular and newspapers more generally uh, the primary source for the works that she was producing uh, as a painter. Um, she became um, uh, more or less well known for putting together an extraordinarily vast archive of newspaper clippings that she then used for her artworks. And a lot of those newspaper clippings um, come from crime tabloids and they reflect the kind of um, subject matter, the kind of uh, interest that these crime tabloids had. Now, um, one, of the, um, one of the consequential things about working with these materials and recording these kinds of events and these kinds of images um, as an artwork for institutions like an art museum, in my view, and this is where my intervention as a scholar comes in, is that um, even though Beatriz Gonzalez did not set out to sort of produce some kind of history of what we now call um, uh, intimate partner violence or violence by sexual means. Even though there might not be an explicit acknowledgement of the kind of recording that she's doing of what we now call femicide and um, violence exerted against women, uh, Beatriz Gonzalez ends up by virtue of closely following these crime tabloids leaving a register of this kind of violence. And now the, those two facts are not unrelated. Um, when one looks at newspapers of record, newspapers like the New York Times in the 1950s and the 1960s and in the 1970s, looking for something like domestic violence or intimate partner abuse or femicide, one runs against a dearth of information. The New York Times was simply not interested. It was not covering this kind of event, this kind of violence, um, this kind of epidemic as we now have learned to, to see it, as we now identify it, and as we now conceive it. On the other hand, crime tabloids that were published around exactly the same time were interested precisely in this kind of event for exploitative reasons and for abusive reasons and in an abusive manner, but they were covering this kind of event um, nonetheless. So for those of us that are retrospectively trying to understand a longer history of some of these forms of abuse and some of these forms of violence, the crime tabloid becomes an important and sometimes an exclusive source of information for these kinds of stories, these kinds of images and these kinds of events. Now, um, I'm gonna, um, finish my remarks now by just briefly uh, pointing your attention towards another group of artists um, that I include in this project. That is the OSCO Collective, uh, who was active in Los Angeles in the 1970s and 1980s. The OSCO Collective, as many of you know, it was a group of uh, Mexican American artists who came together uh, and who came of age um, around the time of uh, racial strife in the United States and in California in the 1960s in particular. And these were a group of artists who were more or less of high school age around the time that awareness and consciousness among the Mexican American community in California and in Los Angeles in particular regarding um, the, the, the violence and the abuses of the, the Vietnam War towards Latino soldiers um, was starting to, to emerge. Um, this is a collective that has a, a very rich and very expansive uh, sort of production of, of, um, of experimental and conceptual art. Um, and the reason why I include their work in this project is that um, 
what is perhaps their most well-known intervention is a form of art making that they call the no movies, which I'm happy to discuss with you during the question and answer session. And this um, sort of conceptual form of art making that they involve, uh, that they call the no movies, which we would now describe as a sort of mixture between performance art and conceptual art and photography um, was conceived in large part um, as they themselves admit uh, in dialogue with some of these publications that I've been discussing with you today. And with one in particular that was published in Mexico, but that was read widely among the Mexican American community in Los Angeles in the 1970s. Um, and here's an example of that, that publication. Um, and um, I think I'll close there. So we have enough time for, for question and answers. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to a, a discussion with you all. Thank you so much. That was an incredible presentation. Um, there's a lot to talk about there. And so now we're ready for our Q&A session. Does anyone have any questions? You want to go first? If not, I can go. <laughs> I think, uh, wait. I think that's all. I think I'm having some connection issues. So if anyone wants to go, feel free to do that. <laughs> Sophia? <laughs> um, thank you for your presentation. It was really fascinating, especially um, you're talking about um, archival and nervous ar archival. And then I really liked how you broke down um, nervous and how it shifts through time. Um, have you, I guess you talked about um, further discussing your, um, I'm trying to figure out how to ask a question. <laughs> you, you talked about further uh, discussing um, uh, nervous, I guess. I don't know how to ask this question, but mostly I'm just really interested in um, talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, let's see. I think um, one, one way to sort of to keep that conversation going is to, to think about how um, not just the people, but the objects around us are described and the kind of function that they're supposed to have, right? So archives are, they're a very particular kind of entity because um, as you know, they're made up of, of things, of objects, things like documents and books and manuscripts and photographs and images and artworks, but they're also made up of people. So they're this sort of complex entity made out of living subjects and inanimate objects. Now as an entity, um, an archive is usually, um, I mean, if you were to describe it in a kind of casual manner, it's like a pretty serious kind of entity, right? An archive sounds like a, uh, <laughs> it sounds like a very official uh, and, and, and a very officiating type of entity. Um, it's the kind of place where one usually goes not to be disturbed, but to be informed. You show up to an archive with the expectation that you'll either conf uh, confirm or constitute or reconstruct something like a solid, stable idea of what society is, how it was constituted, and what the different histories and stories converge to make that society, right? So in that sense, an archive like a university library, um, it's a very sort of um, a very... Uh, it's soothing in a kind of institutional way. Now, this other kind of archive, which um, I'll stress again, uh, these crime tabloids, they're not collected by university libraries. So if you go to your own library or any other library that you're familiar with and you try to find these crime tabloids, you won't find them archived. And we can talk about that now. Um, these archives, the, the kind of effect that they have on readers is uh, if not opposite, it is definitely different from the effect that your conventional university library as an archive has on you. These kinds of readings, these kinds of images, these kinds of stories, they, they won't tell you uh, a lot about how a society was formed. First and foremost, instead of providing information or transmitting things like objective facts, the first and foremost effect that they're trying to have on you as a reader or as a viewer is to disturb you, to unpack you through shock. 
So in that way, their sort of transmission um, is much different than what a university library um, is. It's a different kind of archive. And the effect that it has on readers is, is a different effect as well. Thank you. Go ahead, Roger. Thank you. Um, thank you for your uh, presentation. Um, I guess in my experience with most uh, news outlets, there is that um, element of using the disturbing to have an impact on readers or viewers. And I was wondering, how do you see that in the news as opposed to the particular tabloids, because to me that seems to be an element that's really prevalent, especially maybe in today, news everywhere, even in social media, that element of using the disturbing to move more than inform. So um, I think um, there's, uh, when, 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 when you try to sort of, to, to think through the, 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 the major questions and the more, the more pressing problems around the issue of um, disturbing images and disturbing photographs in particular. Um, one, um, one sort of uh, important reference for me is the, the work of someone like Susan Sontag. So Susan Sontag has been writing for, for a very long time about um, what we ought to do um, as subjects, as citizens um, in the societies where we live about um, uh, images that are produced to document the, the pain of others, the suffering of others. Um, sort of what we ought to do, the kind of power that horrific images and particularly images that document the pain of others uh, have in, in our communication and, and in our society. And there's, she goes sort of back and forth through the years. Um, at one point she acknowledges that horrific images are, are powerful and, and she sort of remembers herself as a young woman um, and as a young Jewish woman, thinking about the effects that the photographs of uh, concentration camps had on her as a young woman growing up in the United States in the 1950s. And for some of us, those, that effect is sort of inconceivable because the world of images that we live in today is fundamentally different from the world in which she was living in the 1950s. But at the time when uh, photographs of concentration camps started circulating in the late 40s and in the early 50s, um, it was a life-changing event for many of the people that saw those photographs. All of a sudden, something that was more or less abstract, um, the horrors of war and of World War II in particular, and the, the horrors of, um, of the, the systemic attempt at eradicating a whole people on the basis of, of race and on the basis of ethnicity, it became very real. And it became real on account of those horrific images. So that first moment leads her to believe there might be power in those images of horrific violence because that same power is what led my generation to sort of all of a sudden realize that this, um, this, this reality of war was concrete in a very visceral kind of way. But she quickly undoes her own argument to sort of point out the fact that, um, you know, 40 years after that, um, we can have a plethora, we can have even an excess of images of suffering of the kind that goes on in what was then called the third world to no effect whatsoever. You know, we've sort of become um, uh, immune. We've become desensitized to these images. So I think what I'm trying to do in this, in this project, what I'm not trying to do in this project is the following. I'm not trying to be prescriptive about how horrific images are to be used. Um, I'm trying to describe how they're used in newspaper sources. And I'm also trying to point out the following. For the most, horrific images circulate in certain kinds of communication that come to be socialized, they come to be encoded as whatever is not respectful and whatever is not authoritative and whatever is not institutional. And I'll give you an example. Um, the war on Iraq, as a war that any war, as any other war, uh, produce a series of um, uh, extraordinarily horrific circumstances, 
did not produce a visual record that we know of other than Abu Ghraib, <laughs> other than that series of photographs that circulated around 2008. Um, even though we have images of all kinds of violence circulating um, in our societies, um, a war, perhaps you know, the, the most important war in, in recent history for this country did not produce any kind of visual record of, of horrific images. So it's, it's a sort of, a, it's, it's, a, it's a complex question. And what I do wanna sort of keep in mind uh, or what, what I don't want to do is to sort of, um, I don't want to, uh, I'd like to keep in mind the possibility that horrific images when deployed in a certain kind of way can serve to undo power and that they can serve to help us resist the kind of abuses that go on in war. An example of that, and, and it's, a, it's a sort of a, an anecdote that I found so powerful um, is by a surgeon, um, the, the head of the trauma department at Temple University Hospital in Philadelphia. It's a woman whose name I can't remember. She was featured in a long, um, in a long, um, in a long article in the Huffington Post, I believe, where she's quoted as saying the following, if um, the US electorate had a visual image of the kind of violence that weapons do on bodies, they would feel different about, um, uh, about um, the legislation around weapons in the United States. And then she took her case further and she said, if people had seen what bullets did to the bodies of young children at Sandy Hook, we would not be talking about sort of controlling um, uh, gun violence in the US as we do now. And the fact that those images are not circulating, I think it, it's reflected on the kind of perspectives and on the kind of opinions that we form about gun violence. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that um, to have images of that kind of violence circulating among us on an everyday basis, will just all of a sudden land us on a good place where guns are controlled in the United States. But I do think the circulation of those images has a role to play. And some of these artists and some of these artworks help us understand what kind of role these images can play in an, in an active and in a, a sort of um, generative manner. Thank you so much, I appreciate that. Um, thank you so much um, for your presentation. Um, I um, am wondering, you had said that you couldn't find stories of femicide and certain types of violence in the New York Times archive. Um, and I was wondering if that has shifted over time and if more of those stories are being covered. And if so, if you've done side-by-side -side comparisons of newspapers of record to these more tabloid exploitative um, news outlets and how those stories are covered and whether they use images or not. Um, that's one of my questions. Thank you. No, that's, a, that's a great question. So yes, things have changed. Um, so to stick with the example of, of femicide, the term that we now use to to describe um, uh, violence and, and murderous violence directed against um, women and um, feminine or feminine subjects in general. Um, if you do, uh, it's much easier to research English language newspapers for reasons that we know, um, namely coloniality. <laughs> we have archives, rich archives of newspapers in the United States and you can do keyword searches. So it's really easy to do this kind of research if you focus only on English language newspapers. And the history of that term in English language newspapers is actually quite fascinating and revealing of the kind of coverage that newspapers of record have of these tawdry, intimate, banal forms of violence, such as, you know, femicide. Um, if you do a quick search of the term, some of the earliest uses in newspapers like the Chicago Tribune and the New York Times are from the 1960s, but the term is used um, to either uh, publicize pornographic films. So the term is used not to denounce femicide, but to describe the subject matter of a pornographic film. So in an exploitative and an abusive way, or they're used, I think it, the Chicago Tribune published this horrible sort of Christmas time recipe for a cocktail where the anecdote included the term femicide, but again, in a kind of comical and in an abusive sense. And the term only starts, it only gets picked up 
by the New York Times and the Chicago Tribune and all these major newspapers of record in the English speaking world after a conference that took place, I think it was in Brussels in 1976, which was a, a sort of a, a response to the 1975 United Nations Conference on Women that took place in Mexico City in 1975, the year after, the year before that. So, 1975, the United Nations organizes a famous or infamous uh, conference uh, on women and by women. Um, this conference, though um, uh, widely celebrated, was quickly denounced for being um, more or less um, oblivious to issues that have to do with race and issues that have to do with class and issues that have to do with sex work. So a year after that, um, a group of women, activist women, um, sex workers, um, and um, uh, lesbian activist groups organized a sort of a, a, a counter conference, so to speak, in Brussels. And in that conference in Brussels, um, issues that had to do with sex work, issues that had to do with violence against women, and issues that had to do with femicides were widely covered. And these newspapers, when they started covering that conference, then they started using femicide in the sense that we associate today. So 1976 is the sort of, it's a, a pivotal moment in English language newspapers. And after that, uh, slowly but surely, and, and when I say slowly, I mean slowly. <laughs> slowly but surely, those, those, that coverage starts accumulating. And you start seeing a growing proportion until you get to a moment like today when it's not rare in 2021 to find the New York Times covering um, domestic partner abuse um, and, and femicide. But um, that has been sort of changing since the mid 1970s, more or less, until the present time. Now, when you look at newspapers of record, and this is work that I'm doing with a group of, um, of research assistants uh, who are helping me sort of code newspapers of record and crime tabloids. When you look at crime tabloids from the, from the 1950s forward, just about every issue has at least one or two reports on either intimate partner violence, uh, violence against women or femicide. Now I wanna stress again, these articles are very abusive. These are not sort of articles that you read uh, and that, that, that give you a sense of a, a just and dignified coverage of the lives of these women. They're very exploitative and they're very abusive. However, if you're interested in the history um, of this form of abuse, it's a sort of almost you know, unique and, and, and solitary source of information because it's not the kind of story that you're gonna find covered in the New York Times. Thank you so much for your answer. Just a quick follow-up. Um, um, did you cover the gender demographic of these crime tabloid papers? Yeah, so we're coding for gender and we're coding for sexual difference too. So um, we're coding for uh, the kind of uh, the number of, uh, or the percentage of reporting that goes to crimes and then the percentage that goes to um, violence that involves women and the percentage that involves violence that involves um, subjects marked by sexual difference. So yeah, we're coding for that too. And, and the, in, in, in the readership as well, who's reading so, them? So in the readership, that, that's, um, that's a little, uh, that's beyond my, <laughs> my, uh, my field of expertise. So I rely on colleagues in the social sciences, uh, namely in sociology, um, and in ethnography that have done some, um, some, some, um, some work on this. Um, so I know that there's colleagues in Chile and Colombia and in Mexico that have done anthropologies of the readership of these kinds of tabloids. But now that you ask the question, I don't think they're accounting for gender. They're accounting mostly for class. And for instance, for the fact that most of the readership of crime tabloids up until the 1980s and 90s was what you would call a popular readership, working class readers, recently urbanized readers and poor readers. But I don't think they're accounting for gender. Now, one thing that you could do, I can do, we can do speculative, speculatively, and this is something that I've done for other research projects, is to speculate about the readership um, using the advertisements that are published in this newspaper. So often you get a really good sense of who's reading the newspaper, by looking at the advertisements, because that's a that's a pretty sort of uh, trusty um, sort of uh, information loopback mechanism. Uh, <laughs> uh, the advertisements are published because uh, uh, 
whoever's interested in that advertisement is reading the newspaper. So it's completely speculative and it doesn't follow the, the methods that people in anthropology are following. But um, I found it to be at least um, revealing in a hypothetical kind of sense. Thank you so much. Yeah. Melanie has a question. Um, Melanie had a question. She said in the chat, I had a question regarding nervous. Oh. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Can people hear me just in something in the chat? I think I'm having connection issues. Okay, okay, cool. So Melanie said, I had a question regarding nervous archives and nervous knowledge the deep-rooted feelings of uneasiness with disturbed images. Have you thought of ancestral trauma having a relation, a similar relation, but to one, one's own by, body? Could ancestral trauma possibly be connected to nervous knowledge and archive? Uh, yes, thank you, Melanie, for that question. Yes, definitely. In fact, um, so one of the, one of the ideas I'm exploring with this, um, this notion of a nervous archive has to do with the ways in which we think about and conceive of communication. Now, usually I think most of us, um, we are socialized into, into, into thinking um, primarily, sometimes exclusively of communication as, as something that happens at the level of um, concepts at the level of sort of cognitive function, at the level of sort of verbal and, and, and visual communication, right? We think about how we connect with others and relate to others in the sense of exchanging meaning as something that takes place sort of from subject to subject using certain kinds of tools and certain kinds of mediums, right? So like verbal mediums, visual mediums, the kind of thing that we can conceptualize as, um, as, a, as communication, something that I think about and then I transmit to you using either words or images, right? Using either stories um, or, or verbal language. Um, a lot of the people um, who are informing the conceptual framework of my project are trying to think of what they call a different form of transmission, a different form of exchange, a different form of communication that does not necessarily, that doesn't even primarily rely on words or on visual images in order for two people to be connected in meaning. And this is a form of transmission or exchange or connection that has been theorized by someone like Teresa Brennan as the transmission of affect. So what she's trying to do is to sort of um, tune our attention into the fact that a lot of times we connect to each other or we transmit uh, scare quotes information to one another, not by sending words, not by transmitting, transmitting language or images, but by somehow transmitting what she calls affect, which is to be conceived more of an energy or a force and not so much a form or a concept. And what she means by that is the following. This is something that um, someone like Gloria Saldua, for instance, thought about at length. What happens when you walk into a room and you sort of feel the air, you sort of feel the atmosphere, you can't really describe that experience, that awareness, that knowledge as some kind of conceptual communication. And what Teresa Brennan does is to describe that as a, as a transmission of affect. I think um, ideas of ancestral trauma and ideas of something like corporeal knowledge or embodied knowledge, they, they have to do with this other form of connection or communication that has to do with transmission of affect. Um, and, and it's the kind of sort of, uh, it, it's the kind of, um, uh, um, the kind of impact that these tabloids can can indeed have. So yes, um, I think there's there's a connection to be explored there. Um, I I guess this conversation is making me think about how the history of words and how they stay the same and how they change. Um, and so I was curious, have you seen? When it comes to um, crime uh, newspapers, have you seen a pattern in um, in how words are utilitized after war? Right, right, right. So, um, 
You mean how words are used in, in crime tabloids in particular? Well, yeah, like has it shifted, ha like propaganda um, during uh, World War II? Like have words, ha have you noticed, have you been able to like mark when the wor word shifted, when the meaning of the word shifted? Of which word? Um... Oh, uh, uh, or, um, nervous. I don't know. Uh, oh, nervous. You're, you're, you're talking about, um, I don't know, throughout your presentation, it just, you talk about the history of words, and um, and I, I think I think about that lot, a lot within my own own research. But I think about it within pattern, and so I'm curious: Have you seen pattern in um, uh, crime? Sorry, uh, in in uh, in the archives. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, I think here's one pattern um, that I'm interested, and in, that I'm sort of following. Um, I think. Um, there are, so words, um, like any kind of expression, like any kind of um, a thing that we produce in order to be in touch with each other and in order to, to, to build a place in the world and in order to understand the world, um, they can sort of have different functions, right? And different dimensions. And the, the difference between that function and that dimension ends up creating sort of hierarchies of what kind of communication is, is more respectable and it's more enfranchised and what kind of um, communication is sort of less respectable and less enfranchised. So one thing that I've noticed is the following. Um, if you look at newspapers in the 1950s, there was a very clear division in terms of how language was used by a newspaper of record on the one hand and by something like a popular publication on the other hand. A newspaper of record in the 1950s the kind of language that it used for its news section was very objective, it was very dry. It often lacked what we now would call a first person or subjective perspective. And it often stayed away from anything that could sound or that could ring of being emotional or intimate, right? That's how a, a sort of a, a, a journalism discourse was presented in the 1950s. Uh, and that's how a newspaper like the New York Times could make a claim to seriousness, right? The more objective um, and the more, um, the more uh, rigid and rigorous your language was, then the more uh, trustworthy um, you were as a source of information. On the other hand, a lot of these popular print publications, they sort of assume the, the other side of the language coin, so to speak. The language that you see used in these uh, popular print publications is often suffused with emotion, with what we now call intimate or subjective perspective. It's the kind of language that often gets described dismissively as melodramatic um, or, um, or touchy-feely. <laughs> Instead of providing just an account of what happened from an objective third-person perspective, Oftentimes, these popular print publications, they sort of put the reader right in the middle of the event by providing a sensorial and an emotional and an almost visceral account of the events that they were reporting on. So I think in the 1950s, that division, it wasn't sort of clear cut because sometimes the New York Times got touchy-feely, you know, and sometimes these Crime tabloids got pretty objective. You got facts from them. But it was, you know, it was pretty polarized. Nowadays, I think that division, especially in terms of a publication like the New York Times, news, a newspaper of record, that division is not collapsing, but is not quite as stark. I think most of the journalists that who we admire and who are publishing in these respectable and sort of um, institutionalized platforms such as the New York Times, they necessarily have to engage with something like a first person, um, intimate, emotional experience, because that's what we ask from our communicators now. I think our communicators now, even the most enfranchised and the most institutional, institutionalized of communicators are famous newspapers, are professors, are writers, um, are, are sort of journalists writers they have to present some kind of first person perspective because the expectations we now place on how truth is presented have changed. Now we tend to be dubious of someone that comes to us uh, with a story about violence that only presents the facts. <laughs>
we now we want we want that dimension. So that has changed over time, I think. Um, and 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 I I I'm happy to see that because it certainly reflects how I feel about the truth and reality and, and the world. Um, and and yeah, so so that's one pattern I've seen. Thank you. It's interesting. <laughs> Um, thanks for answering our question, Sergio. Um, I was just wondering if you had any insight, um, given like the economic downturn in print, um, print journalism mm -hmm. and how it's less circulated and now we're like communicating through faster channels, um, what your insights are with, um, how like the nervous archive has changed Right. But also thinking about um, the Trump years, I feel like the Nervous Archive has become incorporated into like, you know, what, what I, I mean, I, I don't have any other like term to say, it, but it's like regular forms of journalism. Right, right, right. Yeah, no, it's, it's a, you know, it's, it's always, I think I, I, I'm guilty of something that a lot of scholars do, which is to place a good 20 years of distance between my perspective and the work that I do, because it's easier to see things that are already done and finished. And it's a lot more challenging to sort of think through what's happening right now, because it's, it's even though I make an effort to stay enmeshed in the work that I'm doing, um, I, I make an effort to sort of, to not have the privilege of third person distance uh, perspective. Um, it's still um, always, for some reason, at least for me, helpful to have a little bit of distance in order to think through what's happening. But I have thought about what's happening now and the, the kind of challenges that the current moment um, poses in terms of the use of uh, horrific images or documents of horrific images. And in terms of what this nervous archive looks like now, I think dynamics that have uh, burdened us for decades, I think, uh, divisions that have worked against us in the past are once again working against us um, in this moment. And by that, I mean the following. If you follow, if, if you sort of follow with interest what happened during the Trump years in terms of how um, violence was documented and presented and circulated for persuasive purposes, uh, the uses of those documents of violence, they follow along that division of the political spectrum that we've learned to sort of apply to just about every aspect of life and every aspect of communication. Um, users or subjects on the right side of that political spectrum have a certain um, appropriation of those images of violence and users on the left side of that political spectrum have a certain use or lack of use of those images of horrific violence. So for instance, if you do, you don't even need to go too deep into social media or online platforms. But if you follow something like reproductive rights as a debate um, that was um, that was pulsating in the Trump years, there's a dearth of images of how um, that policy making affects women in their bodies. We have no images. There, there's just there's very few images of the kind of impact that that's having on women's bodies, and we have plenty of images from those that are advocating for the restriction and the limiting of reproductive rights and reproductive issues. Something like this is it the Southsboro Church? Do you guys does that ring a bell? The the South. I can't remember the name of that church, but there's a church in particular that uses very horrific and very graphic images of, of what happens, um, what happens uh, during uh, abortion procedures. And yet uh, we, we have a sort of a, a lack of visual imagination of the impact that these laws are having on, on women who are affected by the restriction of, of um, reproductive rights. Another sort of example that I've had in mind and that, that's, that's close to, to heart and close to home to me, so to speak, is when we think about um, something that was widely discussed during the Trump years, which was, um, you know, abusive immigration policies, there was that one moment when the incarceration of children became part of um, the news cycle. And when all of a sudden, all of us were forced to reckon with the fact that our federal government was putting children in cages. And that circulated as a sort of verbal images, right? 
children in cages as a headline for the Trump immigration uh, policy. Now, if you do the sort of visual anthro, um, like visual archaeology of what that moment looks like, there's not a lot of images of, <laughs> of what that sort of, what that was, you know? And again, this is, it's dangerous and it's tricky because the moment you start circulating those images, you have to be careful and mindful of things like, you know, um, trauma porn and the exploitation of these children and exposing sort of in an undignified way um, people, young people at their most vulnerable. So it, it, it's, it's dangerous and it's not easy work. At the same time, the fact that we don't have a sort of a photographic document widely circulating of these forms of abuse prevents us from sort of, um, from, sort of uh, from grasping the, the, the concreteness of that violence. For me, for instance, the, the first time that I saw um, that headline, uh, Incarcerated Children by Immigration Policies of the Trump Administration, the first time I saw that on television as a visual image was during J-Lo's um, like halftime NFL show where she, she actually, I don't know if you guys saw her halftime show, but it was a great halftime show. And she used her platform to sort of, um, to structure the choreography to suggest incarceration of children. She had children, I think it was children or young dancers incarcerated in like laser kind of lights. It was kind of awesome, you know? And I was like, good job, JLo. But you know, you start wondering, do you, would the conversation and the discussion change if people uh, out there in society and the electorate had not just a headline, but a picture of what children in jail looks like? And again, I don't know the right answer, and I know the right answer is not just to start circulating these photographs because that can certainly that can quickly turn abusive. But I do think it's interesting that a certain kind of conservative approach to the horrific, the reproduction of horrific images tends to be um, uh, working on the, the more progressive side of politics where an exploitative and an abusive and a kind of um, excessive use of these images tends to be working on the more conservative side of the political spectrum. Yeah, it's like a, it's a, it's like a, like a long-standing prudishness on the part of progressive leftist thought, and and to which I subscribe. But it, it just sort of makes me wonder um, whether that prudishness is is serving the the aspirations to social justice that those of us that subscribe to the leftist progressive side of the political spectrum are supposed to be pursuing. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Um, I have one last question before we run out of time. Um, so you said right in the beginning that in the English speaking world, uh, these crime tabloids became very popular in the 19th century, but in other countries in the 20th century. And I was thinking about that in the case of Latin American countries and how many of them were going like to dictatorships and then democracy and then dictatorships again. And I was wondering how that influenced um, this kind of sense sensationalism, I don't know how to say that word, uh, journalism, and also the, the artist, so that combination of this kind of archive and art production. Right. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. Thank you um, for, for the, the chance to, to talk a little bit more about this. So the, the, the period that um, I'm studying with more attention, uh, it, it overlaps precisely with the emergence of dictatorial regimes in the Latin American region. Um, and there's a, a couple of um, a couple of, uh, of examples that I think um, speak to your question about the kind of role that these tabloids were playing uh, before, during, and after the emergence of these dictatorial regimes. So if you look at the example of Chile, for instance, Chile, as most of you know, has a, a sort of a fascinating um, history of, of, of democratic uh, rule. Um, interrupted by, by a dictatorial regime. Um, Chile was one of the longest standing democracies up until uh, 1973. They had held elections regularly uh, and transparently uh, for one of the longest stretches in the, the history of the Western world. And towards the end of that period um, in the early 1970s, um, they, they elected democratically the first, um, the first president who uh, was affiliated to a, a communist party. Uh, they elected Salvador Allende. So um, it, this is a sort of a long and complex picture, but one thing to keep in mind is that 
um, the election of, of Salvador Allende, um, who was assassinated on the day of the military coup in Chile, uh, September 11, 1973. Uh, his rise to power uh, came on the heels of the, the sort of the, 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 the rise and the organization um, and the mobilization of a large uh, industrialized working class in um, urban centers in Santiago and the emergence and the organization and the mobilization of peasants and rural workers throughout Chile. Um, so there was a, a sort of a very dynamic and very electrifying moment of mobilization by, by popular and working classes in Chile that eventually led to the election of Salvador Allende. Now, at the time, one of the most popular um, newspapers in the whole country was named Clarín. And this newspaper, um, uh, when perceived uh, in comparison to other newspapers uh, published in Chile at the time, it was a low quality newspaper. It was low quality because it was low cost. It was literally low quality because the paper was really low quality. And it was low quality because the stories it, um, it told, the coverage it had, and the way those stories were told were not associated with the register of a newspaper of record. So for instance, um, if the newspaper of record, El Mercurio, reported on a, the president falling, uh, the, El Mercurio, the newspaper of record, would say something like, oh, uh, the president had an unfortunate incident when he was you know, descending the stairs of the building where he works. El Carim would report on that exact event by publishing a photograph and by saying like, oops, <laughs> president takes a fall. You know, it was like, it was comical. It was, it was forward um, and it was, it was very popular. Now, because this newspaper was commercially viable, because it was very popular, it could take um, a kind of uh, stand against any kind of government that was in power at the time that other newspapers that were dependent on government subsidies couldn't. And this newspaper in particular ended up taking very critical stances, both against the conservative um, governments that came before Salvador Allende and against the government of Salvador Allende itself. And in fact, some of its editorial lines were so um, autonomous, so to speak, that it was the first major newspaper that was closed and censured by the by the dictatorship in, in 1973. So it's it's you know it's it's interesting. And then following the, the military dictatorship, other um, crime tabloids uh, emerged to sort of capture that readership that had been uh, cultivated by Clarín. One of them was the one that I shared with you during the, the slideshow, La Tercera de la Hora. And artists sort of quickly started um, referring to the crime section of these newspapers to look for the kind of information that they had been finding in, in newspapers like Clarín. And one example, and, and I'll just very briefly describe that because it's I find it to be a very compelling example, is an artist by the name of um, Francisco Smythe, who in 1973, months after the military coup had taken place, he starts collecting, um, hold on, my screen just, he starts collecting the classified ads of disappeared people. So this is something that some of you may have seen, but in, in, in newspapers, especially before the advent of sort of social media, it was, it was relatively common to find classified ads announcing um, lost people, right? So if either due to advanced age or mental illness, someone became lost, um, you would place a classified ad in the newspaper um, announcing that this person was lost and you were looking for them. And in Spanish, the word for that is desaparecido. Now, disappeared, desaparecido is also the term that started uh, being used to describe those people that have been abduct abducted by the military regime um, without accounting for that abduction. And what this artist does is to sort of reproduce those disappeared classified ads under the military dictatorship, but pretending as if those were just reproduction of disappeared people and not a critique of the military government. So there's a very sort of interesting triangulation going on there. And it's uh, an example of the kind of work that artists were doing with these crime tabloids after the military dictatorship. Thank you so much for answering my question and for joining us today. Um, it was really interesting listening uh, more about your work. But this concludes our talk for today. 
when next week um, Caroline Kent is joining us on Wednesday at 1030 again. And um, so I hope to see y'all soon. And yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. Absolutely.